Thank you. Thanks a lot. Are you ready? Okay, welcome back. Welcome back. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Eitan Rupin. Um, and Dr. Rubin is an MD, PhD, a professor of computer science here at the University of Maryland. Um, he was a professor of computer science and medicine at Tel Aviv University before joining us. And here he's also the director of the Center for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology. In his research, Dr. Rubin develops and harnesses computational systems biology approaches for studying cancer, aging, and neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, Dr. Rubin and his lab members identify novel drug targets, biomarkers for diagnosing and treating uh, disorders. Uh, these efforts have led to the discovery of new selective drug targets for renal cancer and new approaches for harness harnessing synth synthetic lethality to treat cancer. And today he's going to tell us, ask us a question, can computers really help fight cancer? Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Is it is it on? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So it's uh, it's uh, really uh, a pleasure to be here. Usually I'm invited to you know places across the planet where they don't know me. You know that's the basis. So here people have actually know me and yet invited me. So that's quite quite encouraging. Uh, so so. Uh, yeah, so I, the, the, the bad news is this is just was a question to lure you to come here. I'm just going to talk about our research, okay? And then you will decide what is the answer to this question, okay? And we'll have a vote at the end of the talk, okay? Good. So listen and listen carefully. And all the work that I've I'm going to present today is actually done by three of wonderful grad students of mine, uh, Livna Gerbianon in Tel Aviv and Avinash Das and Jules Sangli, who is a postdoc here in Maryland. Okay, so you can see it's a very multidisciplinary, ethnically re rich team, right? It like, looks like a beginning of a joke, right? An Israeli, an Indian, and a Korean. What good can come up of it? So, I'll hope to show you that some good can, can come out. I'm just actually trying to win some time because my wife and kids should be here, but you know what, how it is. Yeah, they decided probably to go and have some ice cream and have a better use of their time. Anyway, so uh, the talk. I'm going to describe a bit the challenge of curing cancer. And then I'll describe these, you know, our efforts to use a computerized analysis of data using these frightening words, synthetic lethality and synthetic rescues, to describe to you really what we think is, is really exciting stuff that can enable us to make, you know, future steps in, in, in enhancing the treatment of cancer. So don't be afraid of any of these words. They are actually quite simple, and I'll explain everything. And feel free to stop me anytime you wish, OK? Cool. Um, so what's the challenge of curing cancer? So, so as you know, cancer is a, you know, the major killer. Um, regrettably, you know, still the major killer in the U.S. and so on. And we have drugs, and we are making important strides uh, uh, in advancing our treatment. However, I would say that there are two main shortcomings of current cancer treatment. Okay? One of them is that the drugs that we have are not good enough. They are not selective enough. Okay? And that's why they incur a lot of side effects, as you know, from chemotherapy. And they limit our ability to dosage as we want and all that. The drugs are simply not selective enough, not effective enough. There's a need to find new targets. And second of all, even with new drugs, okay, even with new drugs, after some time, regrettably many times, there is resistance emerging and there is a relapse of the tumors. So does anyone in the audience know what is the criteria of success by the FDA now to approve new cancer drugs? So you invested two, three billion dollars, 10 years, company comes with a new oncological drug. What is the criteria of success? How much life extension does a new drug have to show in order to be approved by the FDA? Anyone? Excuse me? So, uh, wow, wow. 
Not so bad, but not far away. Four months. Four months, guys, two, just to, that you get the magnitude of the challenge, okay? And I want to persuade you that these three guys that you've seen before, okay? The Israeli, the Indian, and the Korean are making important strides, preclinical, initial, in this direction. Okay. So, as a caveat, I want to say, on the other hand, I'm not going to fall into the pitfall of overselling. Cancer is very complex, it's many diseases, and then um, it's not going to be solved tomorrow, okay? I'm going to simplify and talk about cancer as a pun cancer, you'll see, but what we can do, we also carefully do for specific disorders and so on, okay? But of course, it's, you know, preliminary work. Okay, so our work fall, falls under this buzzword of precision oncology. The idea is that usually before, okay, before I mean until five years ago, we would take a biopsy of a tumor and based on the grading and the staging, certain histological microscopic criteria, we would tailor treatment. But now there is a revolution because of the omics data, our ability to measure, you know, a large scale, to sequence, to measure gene expression, to measure proteomics, to measure metabolomics, we can hopefully do but much better by obtaining information on the molecular profile of the tumors and trying to tailor the treatment for each individual patient based on its molecular profiles, okay? And by the way, we're very fortunate to have Lihud here. He has made seminal contributions to our abilities to, to do these measurements, okay? Now, most, and when I say most, I mean 99% of all scientific ventures, companies, whatever, in, the, in this field of precision oncology, are sequencing, using deep sequencing, okay, just 300, 400 genes out of our 20,000 that are involved in cancer, that are cancer driver genes. So they are looking on just on a certain window of genes, and they are looking for actionable mutations. What are actionable mutations? Mutations that have been reported in the literature to be involved in cancer, and there happen to be reports that certain drugs will get better response if the patient's tumor has a specific mutations, okay? So it's basically like a lookup table. Based on the literature, laundry list, you see deep sequence, three, 400 genes, and you try to tailor the treatment. And that suffers from many shortcomings. There is low coverage. Many <coughs> patients can't be helped with that and so on. And it's, and it's not, it's a laundry list, okay? Still, it offers a value and so on. And just to throw a number, Foundation Medicine, one of the leading companies in this field, just, you know, was founded two, three years ago, like a few months ago. Roche bought 30% of the shares of Foundation Medicine for $1.2 billion, okay? Now, what I'm going to show you today is that these guys in my lab have developed a complementary approach, completely different, where we look at the state of all the 20,000 genes in the tumor, not the free 400, and that enabled us to tailor treatment, but not just by looking on a laundry list of what has been achieved, but by new biology that we learn directly from the clinical tumor. So what we are building on, we are building on this TCGA, Transcancer Genome Atlas, which is a wonderful initiative by the NCI, which went sequenced, okay, 10, by now 10,000 samples from patients, where we have the, the, the sequencing, the gene expression, the proomics, metabolomics, we mine that develop a new way to do precision-based oncology. And what we find, in contrast to many times in biology, is quite strong and interesting because it's directly inferred from the clinical data. It's not done in in vitro, in vivo models, as many of you know, many times the, the, what you find is, doesn't translate to the clinic. So all what I'm going to show you is directly identified from the clinical data. So what can we do? Our approach, approach is based on a concept called genetic. It doesn't help if I look at my hand and my watch is not there, right? So 
our approach is, is based on the concept called genetic interactions. It's a fundamental concept in genetics already for 100 years, which denotes the idea that two genes somehow functionally interact between them, OK? We, of course, didn't invent this concept. But we identify directly from this TCGA, from these 10,000 samples, we identify a specific set of genetic interactions, synthetic lethals and synthetic rescues, okay? And we put them in good use, as I will show you, to develop and, and showcase potential translational applications to improve the treatment of cancer. So far, so good, guys? Questions? Anything? Yes? Bats just coming up. Okay, these are synthetic little and synthetic rescues. I will describe and define. Okay, cool, great. Okay, what I'll show you is that we can use this identification network-wide global identification of these synthetic little and synthetic rescue interactions to guide personalized treatment and to give leads for developing new treatments. Okay, so in the first part, I will describe this concept now to science. Until now, it was hype, introduction and hype, okay? So now to some science. Uh, the first part of the talk will, will rely on the concept of synthetic lethality, and it's based of, on a paper that we have published uh, um, last year in Cell and on another paper that is now under review in Nature Genetics. And here you can see all the people that contributed. Livnat Gerbi Arnon led this research in my lab. And this research is done, as most of the research that is done in my lab, is done with, in close collaboration with experimental collaborators. We are very fortunate to have great experimental collaborators. Uh, Tammy Geiger, Paul Clements from the Broad, the Yale Gottlieb of Cancer Research UK, Paul Meltzer from here, the NCI, and Emma Shanks from Cancer UK, Talia Golan from Shiba. All these people have made careful experimental validations to test and corroborate the stuff that I'm going to show you. What's a synthetic lethal interaction? So two genes, A and B, are synthetic lethal, are a synthetic lethal pair. If the knockout of gene A doesn't do anything bad to the cell, is, the cell is viable, the knockout of gene B similarly, symmetrically, the cell is viable, but if you knock out both genes, the cell die. Okay, so there are millions of potential combinations of such pairs, but actually we find in yeast studies, E. coli, model animals, and so on, we find that also it's only a small fraction of the gene pairs, if you knock them out, they are synthetically lethal, means the cell dies. Okay, David, is the definition clear? Cool. And synthetic lethality is a basic, again, fundamental notion in genetics. But in 1997, there was a paper in science by Hartwell et al. This paper has four authors on it. Three of them are Nobel laureates. One of them is just a simple National Academy science member, the poor guy. OK, so this paper is one of the highest concentrations of Nobel laureate authors ever done. And it it's one of the most highly cited papers in biomedical research. It put forward the hypothesis that if we will just be able to find, yes, if, let's assume a magic wand, if we will just be able to find the thousands of synthetic lethal pairs in cancer, that would be a huge step forward in treating cancer. Now, anyone in the audience can tell me why, think, Okay, let's do the following intellectual exercise. I'm taking 30 seconds of my time. I want the young people in the audience to think and tell me why, if we will know the synthetic lethal pearls, that would be a major step forward. The clock is ticking. I got special authorization from Wolfgang to use these 30 seconds. It's actually on his time, not mine. <laughs> Why, if we will know these synthetic little pests, we will able to advance the treatment of science? Okay. Wow. L yes, please. Wonderful. 
both of you. <laughs> Excuse me? Yes, yes, that's a very nice and smart answer, but a complex one. I'm a simple guy. Think of something simple. You have an answer? Fantastic! See, guys, it's so simple. It took 30 seconds for a great guy in the audience to, to find why understand what these four, four Nobel laureates have written. So look at it. Suppose I find a synthetic lethal pair, a specific pair A and B, and I sequence a patient's tumor, and I find the gene A is lost. Now I happen to have a drug that targets gene B. Now in the cancer cell, this is a pair, a synthetic lethal pair. In the cancer cell, gene A is lost. I target gene B. The cancer cell will die, but in the normal cells, gene A is not lost. I target gene B, and the normal cells and the healthy cells are happy. So I get an opportunity for selective treatment, right? So all that remains is to find the damn synthetic lethal pairs. <laughs> there are 500 million in the human genome, and even with all the king's men and all the robotic systems, no way. Until we came last year and published this paper, only a small mere fraction was found. And we found a way to mine directly the TCGA data and to find these synthetic little pairs. Isn't it quite amazing? Can computers really help to treat cancer? That remains to be seen. Now I'm going to tell you the next shameful thing. The basic idea how to do that is very simple. So here is how you can you mine the TCGA data and find the pairs and find the pairs. What you do is the following. You take, for example, any candidate pair you're examining, okay, gene A, and you find that it is lost in a certain frequency in cancer. And you take gene B and you find that it is lost in another frequency in cancer. Now, supposedly, you look at the colors of both genes across the 10,000 tumor samples, and you find that they almost are never lost together. Think about it. That's a strong indication that these may be synthetic lethal pairs. Why? Because whenever they were lost together, what happened? They were lethal, the cells die, and you don't see them in your tumor samples. Wow. Isn't it wow? Now, God is in the details. There's many false positives. You have to do a very careful statistical. You have to correct multiple hypothesis testing for 500 million pairs. There are other reasons why such. So then God is in the details. So it took us two years, OK? But the basic simple observation is Wow, simple, and that's, that's great, because simplicity is great. Complexity may be whatever, I'm a simple guy. Okay? So we did that. And this whole pipeline and whatever, that's just to impress you, right? That we are serious people. We did that. And this is one of these, you know, uh, uh, hairball networks, just to the, you shows you that you can get the, the, the genes are the nodes, right? And you could color them. They have some cluster modular structure. And it confers with what we would biologically expect to find in cancer synthetic lethality networks. And the genes are, uh, uh, you know, uh, highly enriched in, in tumor cancer driver genes, in tumor suppressors and oncogenes, and all that, and all that, and all that. But now you infer these re uh, networks, OK? Now, your goal is, as a computational biologist, together with your, with your experimental collaborators, your goal is to test them, right? To, to convince the biologists that this is real. So here is a few things we did. We've taken all the published data. There were actually six large screens at the time, but you know it's a fraction of everything. And we compared our predictions to those of the in already experimentally tested. And I can tell you that we are far from exact, OK? This is biology, this is noisy, these are computational. We have about 
okay, accuracy, okay, precision recall or whatever, and this is, I don't go into the detail, this is standard AUC, rock caps, whatever, okay? So we're, we're, yeah, it's of course a very highly significant, it's not exact, but let me tell you that if you compare two experimental screens that tested the same system, what is the prediction accuracy, the overlap between two experimental screens? NIST people, about the same, 80%. Okay, so we're in a good place. Luckily, also the experimental measurements suck. Okay, about 80%. So, so that was an initial validation. Then we did something more interesting that already hints to you to the translation applications. We took 1,500 samples of breast cancer patients for which we have the gene expression. Now, we, we have the network of synthetic lethal interactions in cancer. We can take the gene expression from a patient's tumor, and for each tumor, we can ask how many of the synthetic lethal pairs by the gene expression, actually both genes are inactive, have low levels. If both genes on a synthetic lethal pair are inactive, we say that this synthetic lethal pair is functionally active in that specific tumor. You're with me? We are taking transcriptomics of a given patient. We are interlaying it on the synthetic lethal network, and we are asking how many synthetic lethal pairs are functionally active in a given tumor. Now, let's say you have two patients, one of them with many synthetic lethal pairs, active in his tumor, and one with just a few synthetic lethal pairs active in its tumor. Which one do you think will have better survival rate, actually? One patient, oh, so I'll give you a small hint. One patient who is fortunate to have many functionally active synthetic lethal pairs, or one patient who is unfortunate to have just a few? Who will have a better survival, right? So the fortunate patient, why, and why is that? Because since he has many functionally active synth predicted synthetic lethal pairs, it's, it's more likely that these tumors are vulnerable and more susceptible to treatment and so on and so on. And this Kaplan-Meier curve, survival curve, plots the percentage of the survival of patients across time, shows you what a marked difference. Just the synthetic lethal, predicted synthetic lethal profile of patients can actually tell you about the survival. Okay, Steve, you have a question. Oh, cool. Great. So next, we took a, comp a compendium of, I don't know, many hundreds of, of cell lines and many hundreds of drugs for which people have measured an exact quantity which is called IC50, never mind the details, a quantity that testifies for each cell line how well does a certain drug inhibits its growth. So these are experimental values, okay? And we used the gene expression from the cell lines and our synthetic lethal networks to come up with a prediction how well will a cell line respond to a specific treatment. And just to explain to you how it's done, it's again shamefully simple. We just look at a certain drug in a certain cell line. We know from drug bank, whatever, what are the genes that are targeted by a given drug. We look at the predicted synthetic lethal partners of that drug. We look how many of them are underexpressed in a given tumor. If there are many, we predict that the drug will be very effective. If there are just few, we predict that the drug will not be effective. That's all. Are you with me, guys? Simple, right? And look, we obtain, you know, correlations of 0 0.7 with quantitative measures of drug response. It's of hundreds of drugs, cross cell lines, with such a simple, unsupervised, you know, generic predictor. We didn't tune it for any drug or anything. Okay. But this, you would say, is okay, okay. But you're not impressed, because that's in vitro, right? Show me the money, you say, right? That's my next slide, and the next. In this slide, we worked with one of the leading companies in the world that does xenograft mites. So for, the, for those of you who don't know, there is a service that uh, if someone has a tumor, 
you, we can take cells and we can uh, grow them and transplant them in mice. It's called xenograft mice. And then we can throw many drugs on the, on the mice and so on. And, and uh, we can see which one, the tumor best responds and hopefully learn lessons and treat the patients, okay? Now, this takes half a year, costs a lot of money, has a lot of failures. These mice are immunodeficient. Many problems. Very valuable service, perhaps, but many problems. So we worked with that company, we, which we've, by the way, 10 different bioinformatic groups before us have worked with this data, and none have given any use to these guys. So we worked with our data, and we used our synthetic lethality, whatever, to predict the drug response, and lo and behold, in 70% of the cases, again, not always, in 70 cases of the, the patients, we could predict the drug, the best drug that they found after half a year just by looking on the transcriptomic profiles of the cells, okay? So basically, we would take them out of business, right? And basically, then they decided to stop working with us. So the complaint for the previous guys was that they were just worthwhile. The complaint for us was that we were too good and we were driving the company out of business. That's why its name is not listed here, okay? But then we went to patients, and this is a new version. That's the version that in nature genetics and whatever, we developed a new version that enables us for the first time to predict drug response in patients, again, across the TCGA data, using cost validation methods and on independent data sets. And you can see that we can, for many of the drugs, about 70, 80% of the drugs, we can successfully, based on these principles that I explained to you, based on the transcriptomic profiles of the patients, we can successfully predict the response of patients to many different cancer drugs. Okay, so given a new patient, if we get sample, if we get the analysis, we can take an array of 30 existing cancer drugs. We can run them, each of them, and prioritize and, 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 and get predictions on the drugs that would work best on the patient without, in, in no time. And we know in which drugs we succeed and in which not, and so on and so on. Are you with me? Okay. Next, what we did, and this is already published in our cell paper, I want to show you that we can use our approach also to find drug targets for pharmacological applications and do drug repurposing. Lo and behold, what we did, we took, a, uh, we analyzed with our collaborators, the Gottlieb lab, we analyzed renal cancer, a specific kind. There was a major cancer gene called VHL. We found the synthetic lethal partners of VHL. Why is that important? You must understand that our approach opens whole new therapeutic applications to attack cancer that are currently untargetable. Why? Many cancers are resulting of the activation of major oncogenes. Yes, you heard the term, right? Many of these oncogenes, unfortunately, are not targetable directly. But what we can do is we can find the synthetic little partners of these oncogenes synthetic dosage lethal partners, never mind, some technical detail, and we can target them and kill the cancers where these oncogenes are activated. So that's what we did here, and we predicted six uh, 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 major uh, synthetic dosage lethal partners of, of, of VHL and so on, and interestingly, these genes are targeted by other drugs. They are not cancer drugs, okay? These are drugs that are used to treat depression, or blood pressure, or whatever, but they target the predicted synthetic lethal partners of VHL in that cancer type. And we experimentally tested six of these drugs, and in, in five of them, or perhaps even all six, we got a statistically signal, but in many cases, the predicted added value wasn't great. But in two of the cases, in this case, and in this case, the selective inhibition of the cancer cells versus normal cells is quite remarkable and interesting for, as an initial lead for further study and so on. Just to show you that we can use our framework to find and identify new drug targets 
and, and do drug repurposing and so on. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Okay, we published hundreds of such predictions. Yes? Uh, the, the, these are uh, normal, healthy renal cancer cells, and these are uh, renal cells and uh, cell lines, and these are cancer cell lines. Yes, 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 unrelated. These are cancer cell lines, not from the same patients and so on. So different, but you know, you do it and then you control, you do it with random genes and you don't do any selective effects and there's no vulnerability. That's carefully controlled of, right? Uh, I just didn't go into the details, right. So in summary of this part of synthetic lethals, synthetic lethals are a type of genomic interactions which enables us to advance personalized treatment based on transcriptomic pro profiles of tumors and to find and identify new selective drug targets. But when we began our discussion, I told you that there are two major problems in treating cancer, yes? Do you remember what were the two major problems? One of them was selectivity and the other one was resistance. And I haven't yet shown anything about resistance, right? And promises should be kept. So here we go. So this is new work done in the last year in my lab in Maryland uh, by Avin Ash, Das, and, and Ju Sang Lee, who are here in the audience with our collaborators. And the main collaborators are Street and Harley, Harley uh, a professor in the CBCB who is, you know, has our joint partner in the comp devising the computational methods and so on, and Silvio Gutkin. Silvio Gutkin is one of the leading experimental cancer researchers in the NCI, for those of you who know, probably number one in the world in head and neck cancer, and I'll show you some experimental results and stuff like that. And here we aim to use this kind of synthetic rescue interactions to try and target and identify and target one of the major mechanisms for the emergence of resistance in cancer. Now, if you remember, synthetic lethals are a pair of genes that the knockout of each gene doesn't do anything to the cancer cell, but the knockout of both genes kills the cancer cell. What are synthetic, uh, and I should say that there are thousands of papers in the literature about synthetic lethals. Synthetic rescues is a completely different beast, okay? There have been five published papers in the literature about synthetic resin, all of them in yeast. It's, the role is, hasn't been surprisingly acknowledged at all in cancer. What is a synthetic rescue pair? It's a pair of genes that you knock gene A, the cell suffers, okay? It's, okay? The cell is under significant stress, and if you won't do anything, the cell will die. But paradoxically, if you knock out gene B or overexpress gene B, the cell is happy. So the knockout or the overexpression of the other gene rescues the cell from the initial knockout of the first gene. We term the initial knockout, which causes the stress, the vulnerable gene, and the second overexpression or knockout of the second gene, we term as a rescuer gene. And we thought that if we will identify these pairs of genes, we will get this, uncover this network, we will get an, an understanding of an important mechanism of resistance in cancer. Why? Because the cancer drugs, most of them, 95%, inactivate genes. And as a result, what the cancer cells do, if you think about it, they reactivate or inactivate other genes that interact with the target genes in order to rescue themselves. QED, all we need to do is identify these interactions again. We go to these 10,000 uh, uh, yeah, samples out there and we mine them to find out all the candidate interactions. And again, the idea is simple, but Ju and Avi worked you know, 18 hours a day in the last year. I, I, I really, you know, driven them to whatever. They, they can't see me anymore, okay? and, and, and uh, 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 to identify, to develop this computer, to do it rigorously, to correct for false positive and false, you know, eliminate false negatives as much as possible. And that's what we did. And there is a whole pipeline to do that, and this is just a, you know, a whole, uh, whatever, hairball picture of that. So 
you can see the green guys are the rescuers. And the size of these circles is proportional to the degree, to the hubness of these, how many genes these guys rescue. And I remind you, rescue is bad, right? It's good for the cancer cells, but bad for, for the patients. Right? And the red ones are the vulnerable genes. And yeah, those who are in the biology can identify many of notable uh, uh, genes in, in these systems and, and, and so on and so on. And you can devise such networks for each cancer type. Provided that you have enough samples, you can use our pipeline and divide and, 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 and define and, and find such networks for each cancer types and even for cancer subtypes. For example, we did that in breast cancer. And it's highly interesting from a biological point of view to uncover these networks, to characterize them, to understand them. But for me, even what is more exciting is to test them and see wherever they can help us to predict the emergence of resistance, and more importantly, to treat it and to counteract it. So that's what I'm going to show you. So I don't know how many of you guys open and read Nature and Science uh, on a regular basis or whatever. I have to confess, I don't do it. Why? I should. I just write papers. I have no time to read anything. And grants yeah, with Wolfgang. Oh, my god. So. Uh, 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 but if you open science and nature and you read uh, 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 these, these rules, you will find that every two weeks now there's another paper coming out and showing that in a certain drug, we sequenced, we gave a drug to 100 patients in a specific cancer X, and we gave drive Y, and then we uh, did the transcriptomics before and after and all that, and we identify using differential gene expression specific, presumably, signatures of resistance, and then we do some small experiments, and hopefully we can confirm that we identify. So there is a huge effort to identify these signatures. And lo and behold, trust me, without going to the details, just we took the recent papers, four or five papers that were published in the last two, front, two, three months in Nature, and the signatures, and we, you know, we said, OK, let's leave it aside. Let's use our network. And what is the overlap? And we find a significant overlap. So without, we could have predicted these signatures or the main you know, key players in these signatures without spending a dollar or doing any of these experiments. OK? Where are representatives of the American government and the taxpayers' monies? Right? Just by looking on all the data that is out there. So again, we can use these profiles of synthetic rescues in patients to predict their survival, OK? And here you can see the inverse phenomena, OK? So tumors which have a lot of synthetic, functionally active synthetic rescuers, these patients will have better or worse prognosis. If, you, if the tumor has a lot of synthetic rescues, the patient will have worse prognosis, right? And this is just to show you that if you combine the predicted and you measure in each tumor the predicted uh, uh, synthetic rescues and synthetic lethals together and you look at the extremes, you get a fantastic dissociation, a fantastic ability to dissociate between well responders and poor responders. We also with Silvio Goodkin's lab, we took one of the major, you know, master regulator, mTOR. We predicted using our system the, the synthetic rescuer interactions of mTOR. Well, mTOR is the rescuer. And we knocked down, using shRNAs, the predicted genes, vulnerable genes, which mTOR rescuers, okay, rescues. And indeed, you can see that for the predicted guy, there is a significant, extremely notable rescue effect by further knocking down mTOR, OK, as predicted. While if you do it for random genes, 
you, you, you don't get this rescue effect, okay? And we actually, there's more data where we predict, I just don't show it in, in lieu of time, where we predicted genes that will rescue the knockout of, the knockdown of mTOR. And again, we show that our predictions are on the mark. This is pretty amazing. We just take the data out there, we do a whole genome analysis, and then sometimes you're lucky and it works. Okay, this is just to impress you. Avi and Ju built, you know, the major drug-specific synthetic rescue network where you can see for each drug that is used to treat cancer, you can see which are the drug targets. These are the vulnerable genes, okay? And for each drug target, you can see the predicted rescuer genes. That means that if this, you use this drug in a patient, these genes will alter their activity, overexpress or underexpress their activity, okay? In order to the tumor to evolve. And you can see that many of the drugs, this is pretty frightening and sobering, right? Many of the drugs have many potential resistant uh, 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 pairs. So the cancer has many ways to evolve resistance. We took, again, all cancer drugs in the TCGA, and we have shown that using the synthetic rescue profiles, we can predict the response in the clinic for about 80% of the drugs. Okay, this scale is some log rank and whatever. This is a frightening figure. I, I, I don't have much time, so I'll just. This is a frightening figure. This takes breast cancer patients subdivides them based on the survival time to six subclasses based on the tumor progression, okay? And then, based on the transcriptomics and the predicted synthetic rescues, we ask how many of the rescuers and how many of the synthetic rescue interactions are actually becoming functionally active as the disease progresses. And you can see the significant rise in the rescue mechanisms and the active rescuers in the breast cancer tumors as the disease progresses. The disease becomes more and more aggressive and more and more resistant, and we are able to use these synthetic rescue networks to track this evolution. Without going into these slides, let me tell you that there is a pa nature paper just published two, three months ago with, with ovarian cancer, which have taken, uh, uh, treated patients and so on, and measured the gene expression uh, in the initial state, and later on in patients that responded, it measured the gene expression in the patients that were resistant and responded well to the treatments and stuff. So we have a subpopulation of patients for which we had gene expression initially, gene expression uh, of the later uh, stages of the tumors, and for a subset of patients, we know that they are, have relapsed, okay? So we could, for example, see that our predicted uh, uh, resistant signatures indeed became overexpressed in the patients that develop resistance. And when we look initially on the patients that responded and non-responded, again, we could see that our predicted rescue as signature would initially predict who will respond and who will not. But most, I think, interestingly, we could take those patients in the initial, we could just look on the initial transcriptomic signatures of the patients, and with accuracy of 75%, again, not perfect, we could predict out of the patients that responded to the treatment who, after some time, will develop relapse or not. Why is that critical and important? Because we want to know that. Because if we want to know what, we maybe think twice about the treatment, or we may add adjuvant therapy to counteract the emergence of resistance. Can we do that? The answer is yes. Let me show you. We have initial indications that we can do that. This is a very interesting slide, but too biological. Just in one second to say, there's two basic mechanisms, network-based mechanisms, and MDR. MDR are pumps that throw out the drugs. 
We found out in these patients we can trace using transcriptomic activities both the activity of the predicted network bake mechanism and the activity of the MDRs. And we find out that they're inversely correlated. That again bring, brings a lot of support to the idea that we really identify the real guys. And you can see that the cells have two alternative mechanisms of resistance and one of them is sufficient for them. So those who successfully throw out the drugs don't bother to develop network-based mechanisms. But those who couldn't throw out the drugs for various reasons had to develop network-based mechanisms in the patients that have relapsed. Okay? Okay, so a few just summary global slides to give you the picture. So this is again, you know, a not happy picture, a, a rather alarming one. We took all the drugs and, and, and uh, our predicted synthetic rescue networks and the transcriptomics of the TCGA samples, and we estimated for each of these drugs, using these drug sensitivity SR networks that I've shown you before, if you remember, we could estimate how many of the samples that are actually treated by a given drug, we find out by looking at the transcriptomics that the tumors will develop resistance. They are activating rescuer genes. You're with me, guys? Please be kind and say yes, otherwise I'll have to start from the beginning. <laughs> right? That's the last thing Wolfgang wants. So, when we do that, you can see that for many of the drugs currently used, you know, a large proportion of the samples will highly likely evolve resistance in these molecular mechanisms that we have predicted. But, to leave you in a positive tone, we did some analysis to identify for each of these drugs that are left untreated will likely develop resistance, right? You've seen we predicted one single rescuer gene, top rescuer gene, that if we will hit it, we will improve patient survival by, you know, in some of the cases by 100% or even 200% increase in the estimated lifespan based on the TCGA data. You get it? So what we are proposing is a way to identify adjuvant counter-resisting therapies for each drug, we identify specific genes that if we will target them, we will hopefully be able to do something about resistance by network-based mechanisms and so on. So to summarize. So would you get them together? That's a very good question. The question is, give them together from the start. That would be my intuition or carefully wait and see and hit them if resistance develops, and then you can even take the transcriptomic signature specifically, find out which rescuers are actually activated, then, and then hit in a patient-specific mechanism. So as, as Lee rightfully asked, there is a lot to be studied here. And guys, what I am presenting, I am individually biased. I think it's exciting, but it's in a preclinical initial basic study science phase, okay? I think compared that what there is, this is tremendous. And you know, if you would ask me, fund these guys. Fund them like there's no tomorrow. Right? If you really care. But I'm a little bit biased. Right? So I really would like to Thank again, you know, the amazing grad students who made all this happen, right? And uh, Sridhar and I, you know, we, we're just fortunate to, to, to have uh, work with these guys. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. To which one, sorry? Of course. The positive one. Yes, let's think positive. Well, that's not going to be my question. So, <laughs> so you're inferring that these drugs 
are specific for your target genes because you took that out of the database. But the effect may not be direct. For instance, I see drugs in this list which are familiar to me and have very specific pharmacological targets, but I guess will affect a lot of stuff, even the network effect. Right. So your comment, just to explain the comment, so the, the, the comment is, is very just and says and points to some of our limitations that in making our predictions, we are relying on drug bank. Okay, drug bank is, is, is a source, a data source, it's used by everyone, right? Not by us, that specifies for each drug which are its likely targets. And sorry, yeah, you asked that, right. And, and for many of these drugs, this information is perhaps not great. And you're absolutely right, but we work with what there is. And the reassuring thing is that we see that based on that, we still get strong predictive power in predicting response to many of these drugs, right? If that would have been garbage, we wouldn't get this signal. I guess that's not my question. Oh, I'm sorry. So I misunderstood. Actually, I on the specificity of some of these drugs. Yes. What I'm saying is that by affecting something, for instance, if you have an actin inhibitor, you're going to affect a number of processes. And you may infer from your network that you're affecting it Okay, so we are, we are looking at the direct targets of each drug, okay, which we infer from drug bank. So if you believe that drug bank is okay, we are looking at the direct drug targets of each drug. And we are looking on the rescuers, the particular rescue genes of all the targets of that drug. So, right. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. So I think the approach is superb and would be perfect if the system were static, yet cancer cells are complex adaptive systems that can go undergo profound evolutionary changes and you know easily replace the function of one gene, those you're knocking out, with, with another or, or many others. And it seems like that would affect both your SL and your SR approach, particularly for long-term survival. And I think you showed one slide that had out to five or six years, which I thought was nice, but I think a lot of the data were like, you know, initial responses. No, actually, most so, yeah. of the data tra tracks response until 15 years, based oh. on the TCGA survival data. Oh, yeah. I saw six. So 15 years yeah, yeah. response. Yeah, yeah. 15 years. If that's what you're really getting, then that's really profound. I agree. Yeah. And you're definitely... You convinced me. And you're definitely not simple. I know. <laughs> so do you find a difference between spontaneous mutations that cause cancers and inherited cancers? Because you would think people who had inherited cancers, the, they would have had more evolutionary like paradigms for being able to have rescuers than maybe those who didn't. We, we didn't look into that. That's a good question, but we didn't look into that. And I want to, again, to say that we are, look, we are not in contrary to 99% of the research that goes on in cancer that looks on mutations, mainly in three, 400 cancer driver genes. We are not looking at mutations. We are looking on 20,000 genes, and without requiring deep sequencing, we are looking on copy number and transcriptomics. And the cost of such a test in a tumor is about the cost of sequencing with deep sequencing 300 or 400 genes. So the other question I had is a lot of the rescuers that you have up there, um, they're nuclear receptor drugs. I mean, so they are actually affecting transcription. So I was just wondering if there's a difference between how you look at the different rescuing agents. Right. So I want to tell you, I want to answer your question in all honesty, but you have gone away. <laughs> I, and, and I want to tell you that in my feeling, we, we, so imagine we have such networks for different kinds of SR interactions, I didn't go into the details, for practically many different kinds of tumors, 
Okay, and, and we are going, we are now submitting this paper for, for publication to Nature, whatever, when hopefully it, it will get published, we will publish tons of supplementary material of these networks. We don't have the capacity of the knowledge to analyze the biological, hopefully, treasures and insights that are there. We hope to publish it so cancer researchers, which are better qualified than us to this task, when then look at it and so on. And besides, there is so much to do here, and, and hopefully many other groups will follow us. Because it's a completely new approach, and what we have done, seriously, is just the beginning. Yes, please. So I'm an undergraduate, and there are a lot of undergraduates here. And I was just wondering, you know, the research is really profound. It's really um, interesting. And I was just wondering if there's anything for, like, us just kind of emerging in the fields, you know, going into um, possibly even med schools and other places like that to get into this research, because I think it's really big, and it could actually maybe become the next thing to cure cancer. Absolutely, I, I think you must, and I think that these developments, not just our work, yes, this our work is just one drop in the work, right? There's a lot of fantastic work the, uh, uh, that is out there that really takes computer to really help treat cancer by many different ways. I've just shown one facet. A lot of this work will change completely the way medicine and, and you know, Lee will talk later on, more general precision-based medicine and so on. I'm just talking on some aspects of precision. It will change completely the way medicine is being done and conducted in, in your generation, and, and hopefully much for the better, and it will require a different kind of education of medical students, okay? I'm an MD, PhD. When I studied medicine, I studied nothing of this stuff, right? So I'm an obsolete dinosaur. <laughs> it will require a major shift in medical education. Some of it is going, but let me guess, not to the extent that we really want. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot.